serve an awesome God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Two little boys were best friends at church. But they both had a reputation of getting into trouble. One Sunday, one of the boys was home sick. But the other boy, not wanting to let his friend down, was twice as bad as normal. As he was running through the sanctuary after church, the pastor grabbed him and angrily said, Where's God? The boy went home and called a sick friend on the telephone. He said, Guess what? They've lost God and they're trying to blame that one on us too. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And if you are a note taker this morning, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a lot of scriptures. And so if you want to be ready and prepared to write those down, feel free to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to, do to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I talk a lot about temptations and trials that we as individuals face. And I'm sure you've heard someone tell you, I don't know why God makes me go through so much. And some of you have probably said something like, God takes people to the breaking point. And frequently or often, it's more than what they can bear. I had somebody come to me this last Friday. They just wanted prayer. An individual came into the office and she was pretty much at the end of her rope. A relative had passed away. Another close friend was facing some very difficult issues, some very serious issues in their life. And when people are in situations like that, and they ask you to pray for them, and they ask you to pray for God's help in their life, one phrase that I want to use is, let go of the rope. Let God have control. God says he will make a way of escape, but one thing we have to do is allow him to have control of the situation. The Message Bible says it like this. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limits. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Amen. And there's a few more words as we back up to the King James Version here in verse 10. This stands out to me. It simply says, but God is faithful. There's two things you will know after reading verse 10. Number one, you will have trials and temptations. And number two, God is faithful. Faithful. Let's define faithful. To follow through with a commitment regardless of its difficulty. Second part of the definition is firm in belief, reliable, dependable, honest, and loyal. Psalm 100 verse 5 in the New International Version says, For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God has been faithful since the beginning of time. I was thinking the other day, a friend of mine stopped me and he was talking to me. He told me about this soil truck heading north on highway 101 
and he had punched in on his GPS for the town of Redway. And he gets to the south end of Bell Springs Road. And he pulls over because the GPS tells him he needs to take Bell Springs Road as a shortcut to get to Redway. GPS is not faithful. Just so I don't to know that. God is faithful. God is faithful to keep his promises to us. I want to give you some examples of that. A rainbow. We all know what a rainbow is. Because God signed to us that he will never destroy the earth with a flood again. That's found in Genesis chapter 9. Matthew 24, verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, For where two or more, two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Hallelujah. What do we have right here? How many we got? We got more than two or three. God is here. In our midst. And I often think of this when that person that came into the office told me they needed prayer. Three of us didn't hesitate. We just joined together and prayed with that individual. And I want to encourage you to be sensitive to those needs around you. Don't just let somebody, when they come and talk to you and tell you about all the problems, tell you they're crying out for help. Just volunteer to pray with them. Where two or three are gathered together, He is in their midst. In fact, it didn't just happen once on Friday, it happened twice. And I was so excited. We were had the opportunity to pray and to encourage. Another promise is found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know. What do you know this morning? I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. God tells us He knows what His plan is for us. I've got just two more I want to share with you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 31. It says He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, He increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall <coughs> utterly fall. But those who wait those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Can you imagine this? How many of you have ever felt weak? Not, not, not physically, but spiritually. Some of the hands went down there. Oops. Praise too quick. What's God say here? It's a promise in the Word to you. If you feel weak, He will strengthen you. He gives power to the weak. He increases your strength. Simple question. Do you want more power in your life? Do you want more strength in your life? Then what do we have to do? What, what does it say? Wait on the Lord. You know, one of the things I think about is I talk oftentimes about the panic prayer. When you're in a crisis, you panic and you go, Oh, God, help me! But you haven't spent time in the Word. Up until then, you haven't had that communication with your Heavenly Father. My challenge to you this morning is to spend time in the Word. 
Amen. Spend time in prayer with Him so that your strength is built up. And when those trials come, you have that strength, you have that power at the right time. Now, He gives to you and He wants us to give to Him. Here's the last scripture I want to share with you on that. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33, it says, But whoever listens to me... Is that one hard? Whoever listens to me... I'm not speaking to me about me. This is God speaking. Whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Thank you, Lord. Now, all of these scriptures I gave to you are promises to you and I and proves God's faithfulness. <clears throat> Bible says to prove me herewith and know that I am God. In other words, he's telling you, you don't have to just take what I'm telling you in the word. Put it to the test. Let God be proved. Claim these. Claim these scriptures. If <coughs> when you're going through trials, trials, when you're having a hard time in life, pray them back to God. And watch His faithfulness in action in your life. Every time you see a rainbow, every time you pick up a Bible, every time you begin to worship Him, you can remember His promises to you. And remember that He's faithful. He's faithful. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, it says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. First, when Jesus is speaking to us, Second one, Paul is saying that. And I know some of you are wondering, you know, what that has to do with faithfulness. Jesus said, in short, that we should be perfect like he is perfect. And then Paul says, I haven't got to that point yet. Has anyone gotten to that point yet? No, no I'm sorry. No, I should have asked that. We're working on it. And I know that we need to be working on that. But Paul said also, I'm pressing forward. Or as I put it, I'm pressing on, I'm reaching, I'm striving for all that God has for me in my life. Everything He has for me, I want. I'm selfish. Because I want everything that God's got. God wants us to learn to be faithful. Scripture gives us examples of people in the Bible that weren't perfect, but were described as faithful. Let's take Moses for an example. Moses was the one that God used to lead his people out of Egypt. He was the one who received the law from God, and he was the one who led God's people through the desert for 40 years. <clears throat> His imperfections kept him from going into the promised land. But Moses was not perfect, but he was called faithful. Found in Numbers chapter 2, 7, it says, God, Moses was faithful. David was chosen as a young boy to be king over Israel. He reigned for 40 years, defeating God's enemies. He was called a man after God's own heart. Yet David wasn't perfect. And David, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 6, was called faithful. And I want to give you some scriptures that show that God is calling us to be faithful. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 
It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove to be faithful. When God gives you something, when God has given you a gift, He wants you to be faithful in using that. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And you can see from these verses how God wants us to be faithful in our walk with Him. And also two of the characteristics of faithfulness are loyalty and reliability. We must hold true to our walk with God even as we face trying times. And one question comes to mind. How do we develop faithfulness? Let me answer that with a, a simple illustration. Does an apple tree stand out in the middle of an orchard saying, now how do I develop apples? <clears throat> any, any response on that? <laughs> no. An apple tree produces apples because that's what they do. Galatians chapter 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did you catch that one word in there that we've been talking about? Back up. That faithfulness. That's the fruit of the Spirit. So if these things are not in your life, you need some pruning done. Is that what you do to an apple tree? You prune it every year? Get all ready to see it grow again? And, and what, what's, what's pruning? It's cutting, snipping here and there. You know, sometimes it hurts. <laughs> If these things are in your life but not developing, you need some pruning done. Faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit is the product or the outcome of God working in you, the Spirit of God working in you, or that which God's Spirit produces in us. So it should be a natural product of a Christian. Is faithfulness. Next, I need to realize that faithfulness is not so much something <clears throat> I'm striving to develop, but something I want to allow the Spirit of God to develop in me. As a Spirit led Christian, we produce fruits because it's the natural thing to do. We don't have to sit around and think about it. Or analyze it, or try to figure it out, but we as Christians should have all the fruit of the Spirit active and growing in our lives. I'm not saying we're perfect, but it should be developing in our lives as Christians. We as Christians should have all of them active. Here's some things that I believe will help us, will help to see faithfulness grow in your life. Number one, Jesus was tempted. Guess what? So will you. Through those temptations, remain faithful to God. Number two, develop consistent habits in your life. And those most important are reading the Bible daily. Praying consistently. And you must do this so that when trials and temptations come, you are ready to face them. Peter made mistakes in his life. 
When he got knocked down, he got back up. God chose the faithful, not the perfect, to do great things. Such as Moses. Such as David. God wants to use you to get things done in His kingdom. Has anyone here ever prayed for patience? <laughs> I wear knee pads a lot when I'm doing that. And some of you probably wear body armor because you are going to... <clears throat> So I guess my next question is what happened, but I don't want your response right now. Really, I don't. <laughs> because I know what it is. When you pray for patience, how do you get patience? You go through trials. People tell me all the time, don't pray for patience. Well, I'm going to tell you something a little different. I challenge you this morning to pray for patience. Why? Because if you don't pray for patience, you're never going to grow. Think about that. You're never going to change. You're going to stay right on a level plane, going really nowhere in your life. But the other challenge I have for you this morning is I want you to pray for faithfulness. And then I want you to see what God does in your life. Amen. If you want to grow, pray that God will use you. Pray that God will develop that patience, that faithfulness in your life. And when you look back, you're down the road, you're going to go, oh, wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for helping me grow in you. Amen. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, this morning, I just want to say thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this body that's here this morning, this congregation, Lord. Lord, I know that individuals go through problems, they go through trials, they go through temptations. But God, you are faithful to see us through and you're faithful to provide a way of escape. And I thank you for that. I'd like everyone